There are some situations where a wireless audio connection can really help the production. And while a wired connection is always more reliable, mm -hmm. there are a few simple guidelines that you can follow that will make your wireless system quite reliable. And that's why I've got John here from Sennheiser. We're going to talk about why wireless systems sometimes go wrong, and you experience maybe a dropout in the middle of a show, and the simple steps you can take to avoid that from happening and avoid your show from being destroyed. So let's first discuss just the basics of why wireless systems tend to drop out sometimes. Yeah. The, the most common would be a weak signal. Yeah. Right? And that can happen in a variety of ways. There could be what we call fading issues. So within the space, the propagation of the, of the radio waves is interfering with each other, and your antennas are not in the right position. Your audio signal gets into a null point, drops out. Uh, it could be inter interference from other channels. So someone is broadcasting another wireless system too close frequency range to yours, and they interfere with each other. Off it goes. Um, yeah, there are lots and lots of ways that something could go wrong, but there are also lots of ways to make sure that it doesn't. Yeah. And we discussed in the previous video that you can understand the potential ways that audio or that wireless audio could go wrong. Mm -hmm with a basic understanding of how audio acoustics work. Um, so the further away you are from the source, the quieter the audio will be. Same thing. The further your receiving end is from your transmitting end, the weaker the signal will be. So getting closer yeah. is, is better to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, also, the acoustical principles are, are similar, whereas like in audio, you could have cancellations where the direct signal and the indirect signal interact mm -hmm. and they cause some sort of cancellation. Yep. The same sort of thing yeah. can happen yeah, in the RF world. Yep. Um, obstacles between, right? While it's not necessary to have a line of sight for RF systems, obstacles like a big person standing between their own belt pack and the receiving end, yep. that could have some negative effects. Yeah, uh, you'd, admit, you'd mentioned interference. So that could be someone else's system on a different stage at a festival, mm -hmm. or it could be TV stations, yep. something like that. And there's also something that's sort of more, it's not unique to RF, but it's more um, of an issue mm -hmm. to consider, and that's intermodulation. Oh, uh, yes, the joy of intermodulation. Yeah, yeah it's, it's something we suffer from. I mean, inter intermodulation exists uh, anytime you're working with anything to do with the waves. So we even get intermodulation in audio. But with wireless microphones, yeah, it's, it's a, something that can stop the system from working. Uh, and what happens is, is when you have two transmitters that are transmitting at a set distance, so let's say they're transmitting one megahertz apart from each other, what they will do is they will interact. Those, those, the energy of those two transmission waves will interact with each other and create intermodulation frequencies one megahertz above and one megahertz below those two frequencies. And they'll do it again and again and again. You get, you get first, second, third order intermodulation frequencies and so on and so forth. Um, what it means is you can't actually use those frequency spaces to actually transmit on because there's already transmission energy there because of your wireless links. If you go beyond two channels, you go to three channels, four channels. You know, you're adding even more intermodulation frequency. Those will all start interacting with each other and you, you begin to get this space where if you do an RF scan, you'll see, yes, you'll see the four, five, six, eight major peaks, which are the main transmitters you're working on. And then you'll see this forest of trees appear uh, in the frequency scan, which is the intermodulation frequencies. And the, I think it's the second order or third order ones. Like, again, I'm horrible with numbers, but then you'll see the most powerful intermodulation frequencies are the, the first ones created. And they will sit there and there is no way you can transmit on them because they are so far above the noise floor that is acceptable that your new transmitter will just sit there going, um, I can't talk to my receiver. There's already something here. To do, to deal with that, we have to do what's called frequency calculation, or we had to do frequency calculations. We'll get onto some changes that have happened, but you know, in analog days, in analog RF days, we would have to do very, very complicated maths to figure out where I can do, where I can place my next frequency. Yes, there are software tools. So in our case, we have a, th a thing called Wireless Systems Manager or WSM, 
which is a free software we can you can download from our uh, website, which allows you with our network connected um, receivers, you can connect them and it will do a whole scan for you and set up everything for you. If you don't have a network attached receiver, what you can do is you can sort of do it the old fashioned way. We have, so we have banks and channels built into these. So all of our transmitters and receiver systems operate on bank systems and each bank has X number of channels inside the bank. They are all calculated to be intermodulation free. So that's there for you out of the box. If you're then using devices that are not from the same series and you're using a whole mishmash of um, devices, so you're using our devices, you're using the competition's devices all together in one space. So you're at, say, a trade show and you're doing a, 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 a wireless shoot, you're going to have to compete with other people that are there using other systems. Then it comes down to the classic thing of a little bit of prayer, do a frequency scan on your receiver, and you're literally looking for that RF meter. Is it, is it at zero? If it's at zero, cool, I will risk it and I will hope it works through the entire shoot. And that, that then comes to the whole thing of if you're doing a wireless shoot and you know you haven't been able to do a, a proper frequency coordination, always make sure you're wearing headphones so you can listen to what's going on. Uh, if you're a single person shooter and talent, whew, yeah. good luck. You're gonna, you're, gonna have, you're gonna have a lot of fun. But yeah, it, it comes down to predominantly doing a frequency scan. So knowing that these things happen and these things can cause dropouts, um, what are just some basic setup principles that we can follow to set ourselves up, no matter which system that we're using? Yeah. So first and foremost is you have to do that frequency scan. You have to allow a system to do a frequency scan to see the space, software or no software. Just do a frequency scan off the device. If you can use the software, life's a lot simpler. Once you've done that frequency scan, you are very much aware of what is free for you to use. And you can, with a pretty high level of confidence, work within that space. You then have to think about your antennas and how you're using your antennas. So we mentioned in the previous video, polarization. You know, Make sure that your transmitting antenna is working in the same plane as your receiving antennas, because doing that, you'll get a certain amount of dB loss instantly just from doing that because the polarization is off. So if you're using a, an antenna like this, a quarter wave, half yeah. wave antenna that has an omnidirectional toroidal yeah. um, polar pad, or I guess dispersion it's a, pattern, it's a polar pattern, polar yeah. pattern yeah. it's going to have like a donut shape yeah. coming out this way. This one is tuned best to receive from yeah. that direction. And you're saying that turning at 90 degrees sort of... Yeah, because they're, they're now completely off. They're, 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 the polarization is completely off axis. And we're dealing with electromagnetic waves here. So the polarization is massively important for electromagnetic waves. So um, what's the best way to set up our receiving end antennas? <sighs> straight up. Straight up, both of them straight up? Straight up, realistically. Admittedly, this is a this is a device we can stack multiple receivers on top of each other, and we can't do that. We can't use external antennas. Yeah, then you're going to have to do, you know, one receiver straight up, the other receiver like that. Yeah, you are aware of the fact, you need to be aware of the fact that you're going to have a polarization drop in reception levels. So from that point, you have to make the, the conscious decision, okay, I've moved my antennas, they're slightly off axis now. And then maybe I need to make sure I'm just that little bit closer, stay that little bit closer to the talent. So you, you, you got to think ahead. You got to be, and, and that's why understanding the principles is important because it allows you to make informed decisions. Okay, I'm working with a two receiver system here uh, that are on top of each other. You need to move. You can't have the other receiver sitting here with antennas like that. They will interfere with each other to a point. Uh, so you'd have to do the other one kind of like that, or even straight out like that, uh, and the other one straight out like this. So they're off polarization from each other. Uh, and then yeah, you would have to make a conscious decision of what you do. Do you then by any chance put that body pack on sideways for that other antenna so it's sitting at a different polarization angle, potentially? Do you stay closer, potentially? It's it's understanding one, that loss over distance. So you're already getting a loss by going off polarization axis. You're then going to use the inverse square law as you go with distance to have more absorption of those radio waves by the air. So 
you know, if you, we don't want to do complex maths and go into, into DBs and all that, DB loss and all that, but you know, you make some informed decisions. I'm going to have a loss. I need to be this far away. Let's have a listen. Let's plug in some headphones. Let's do a pre take of whatever I'm doing just to have a test. And that's why, you know, at concerts, you will have a rehearsal, yep. theaters rehearsals. If you are, and I, I, I use it because we're, we're obviously doing this to, 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 to YouTube. I'm doing, uh, you, you, for, if you're doing a shoot at a conference, for example, just do a quick pre-check. Get to where you're going to go and just tell the person you're interviewing, just give me two seconds. I just want to make sure everything's good here. Give yourself the chance because at the end of the day, even with RF, unless you have a big system with all the tools available to you, you're going to have to rely on your ears to listen to what the system's telling you. A lot of systems will show you. So on the, on the front of systems, you will be able to see the RF. So there's RF monitor um, dials. Yeah, meter. Meters, that's yeah. the word I was looking for, thank you. Um, and you'll be able to see, is the RF flickering a lot? If the RF flickering is flickering a lot, that means there's interference, it's not picking up right. Move a little bit closer, see if that helps. No, okay, still flickering. All right, change frequencies. Rock solid RF reception. Okay, we're comfortable. And keep an eye on it. Just keep on looking at, if you can, keep on looking at your RF meters, make sure they're staying solid. If they start flickering, you're listening to what's going on. If something goes wrong, in most cases, you will hopefully have the chance to say, hang on a sec, I'm really sorry. Something's gone wrong with the RF. Someone's walked in with the same system on the same frequency as me. Do you mind, just give me two seconds, I'll reach you and we can just start that question again. Yeah, it's annoying. But these are the things you, you have to deal with. You have to be aware of it. You do the same in audio. When you're doing an audio recording, you're recording a band in the studio, someone's going to make a mistake. You stop, you rewind, you press record again, you go again. So you've you got to keep that same mindset. As long as you follow the rules of, again, do the scan, do the scan, do the scan, make sure your frequencies are free, you should be safe. When you have bigger systems where you can do external antennas, then we're getting into a whole different ball game because now we can have multiple systems going into two external antennas. So that's a great start already because that means everything is on the same set of antennas. And then you can really start moving your antennas. So let's say a club venue. You got the front of the house guy sitting at a table at the back of the bar um, and they're on a small stage at the front. He's firing through an audience of people. So the, the, the microphone is firing to the back of the room. There's 200 people in there, they're all made of 70% water. <laughs> RF signal sucked up. Get your antennas high, high up in the room, on top of uh, microphone stands, get them as high up above the crowd as you can. Yeah, because we know that there's already an attenuation over that distance. Yeah. And we also know that obstructions or a Humans, crowd of people yeah is also going to cause attenuation. We, we can only really at that point fix one of them in the in the heat of the moment. Yeah. We can't really just say, okay, we're gonna go ahead and put this, we're gonna run a snake to get everything. Yeah. We need to keep that wireless mic at that point where it is. Yeah. But the one thing we can fix is, can we remove those obstructions mm -hmm. by getting that microphone yeah. or that antenna higher? Yeah. The other way you could do it as well is, do you really need to be with the wireless receivers at the back of the room? Right. Could you not move to the side of the stage, have one antenna on the left pointing to the middle of the stage, one antenna on the right pointing to the middle of the stage, so it's covering the entire stage, and then you run an audio cable. Now, we're in the world of digital audio, so that becomes a whole lot easier. You could run a Dante cable, you could run an AES cable. We don't have to worry about the XLR, but even in the XLR world, just a pure analog signal across XLR, you are probably better to run a longer XLR cable than you are long antenna cables and a long antenna distance, get, get those antennas as close as possible. That's why you'll often find, even if there is a front of house engineer that the microphone audio will ultimately need to be routed to, the antennas in the wireless systems are usually side stage yeah. so that that wireless connection can be as short as possible yeah. between the person on stage with the transmitter and the receivers at yeah. side stage. And then we convert it to audio, which can run thousands of feet with yeah. no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so there's two principles right there and, and they come from knowing why these things happen, mm -hmm. right? The distance, get it as small as possible because we know that there's attenuation over distance. Yeah. Obstacles cause problems. So make sure that there are as little obstacles as yeah. possible yeah. between there. I've heard something with the polarization that if we know that this antenna 
is polarized mm. or the signal coming from it is polarized and we can't really guarantee that a wireless microphone antenna let's say that's like this at the bottom of your mic will be like this mm. or will be like this yeah. that on the receiving end there's a benefit to having some bit of like diversification between yeah. so if we have one like this one like this is there any truth to that so that when the mic is here this one will pick it up quite well. Mm -hmm. And when the mic is maybe angled this way, this will pick it up well, is that true? Physics wise, there is a point to that. But in reality, the reason we have diversity on our antennas is not so much for the polarization pickup, but it's actually just for the path pickup because you have obviously reflection paths in a room mm -hmm. and you want to have your two antennas in the same orientation so that they're picking up the signal as best they can. I see depending on how the reflections come in the room. So you might get, you know, antenna A is picking up good. All of a sudden, it for some reason, the transmitters moved in the room and now the reflections coming back to it are interfering with the direct signal. So this antenna goes down, gets a weak signal, but this one's picking up a hotter signal. So you're good. You can, I've seen people do that and it may work. I see what you mean though, because now there may be a phase cancellation at this one mm. that this one being a slight distance apart would have picked up well, but now that it's polarized differently, yeah, you've got, you might have another problem yeah. caused there. So it, they aren't really great backups for one another mm -hmm. if they're not um, set up to receive signal yeah. in the same polar polarity. Yeah. It's an interesting uh, concept. I had never thought of that. I mean, I've also, I've also heard people do this <laughs> where, where, they, <laughs> where they twist the antenna down to do stuff. The base system, for pretty much any professional wireless will come with um, an omnidirectional yeah. or you know a quarter wave or half wave yeah. antenna that goes straight into the receiver. But sometimes you're not able to just put the receivers just on the side of the stage. Yeah. And even in some cases, the stage is so large and uh, the musicians will be, or the performers will be walking in such a wide area that the antennas that come with the system aren't necessarily going to be best yeah. suited. So that's when we come into both remote antennas. The system receiver can be in, in a closet somewhere. We can run an antenna cable to get the antenna closer to the transmitter. And we also get into different types of antennas. Can we talk about the types of antennas first? So how does this one function and how are some other ones? So we, we, that's, a quarter, that's a quarter wavelength antenna. It's a whip antenna uh, just because it, we, you know, it's a bit flexible, but we call these types, these little stick antennas or whip antennas, uh, the same thing. They're toroidal. So it's an omnidirectional uh, pickup pattern. You also get paddles. So it, looks, it just looks literally like a, a half cricket bat. Sorry for using British terms here, but half cricket bat. And it's literally a straight paddle straight up and it's relatively thin. Again, that's an omnidirectional one. You then get fins, which look like a shark fin almost. Those are directional because they, they have the antenna inside it is a, is a, a whole series of um, veins with a long tube down the center. And that is a directional cardioid antenna. So that one you would actually want to point toward Absolutely. where the musician or the performer will be. Yeah. And you may say, oh, that's better in every kit situation. Well, not necessarily. No. If, if you don't know where the performer is going to be, yeah. it, really a toroidal antenna would be best because it's going to pick up 360 degree circle yeah. around that. Whereas if you know where the performer will be and they're quite a distance away, yeah. you can use that more directional antenna yeah. and point it toward them, right? Then we also have a spherical antenna. So it looks like literally a half basketball stuck onto a metal plate. And inside it, the antenna is doing this, it's spinning. Uh, like a helix, yeah. right? And that is to help with this polarization thing. So again, it's a directional antenna. It's pointing towards a source, but because it's the antenna itself is twisted, it means that should the polarization of the transmitter change, it's not affected by picking up on a spherical antenna. There are others. There are Yagis, which are the ones that look like TV antennas from the 80s, if you remember those horrible things on people's roofs. I don't know if anyone's still got them today, but yeah, they look like those. Um, and there are other types of antennas, but the main ones that, that, that we work with and the main ones that most people work with are the Omnis, the uh, directional, the sphericals, and then, yeah, these omnidirectional whip antennas or uh, quarter wave, half wave uh, stick antennas that you stick on the back of devices. Yeah. And, you know, we know, of course, I keep coming back to this. We know that the attenuation that occurs between the transmitter and the receiver has implications. Uh, primarily that the further away the signal being transmitted is, 
the higher the noise will be mm -hmm. in relation to that. Yeah. And that, that's fixed whether you're using any type of antenna, yeah. right? I mean, the signal to noise ratio at that point in space is what it is. However, there are active antennas, and I think a common misconception is that the active antenna can somehow filter out the signal better. It's really not about that. You still have the same distance between the transmitter receiver yeah. restrictions there. What an active antenna compared to a passive antenna would, would do is help with cable loss. Is that yeah, correct? It boosts it boosts the, the, the reception of what's coming in. So it boosts the signal as it, as it arrives. Um, you don't have to use active antennas. You can also get what are called boosters, okay. uh, cable boosters. Maybe like go something on. goes in line. Yeah. Okay. And it just, again, it boosts the signal. It does boost the noise as well. It boosts what's ever coming across. But it gives you the chance to, to compensate for that cable loss in the case of a booster. Um, but even when you're using you know, passive antennas, a cardioid antenna, a directional antenna, has a natural boost of reception. It has a, uh, don't quote me, has an X number of dB boost because of its design. Um, when it comes to boosting your signal, yeah, I mean, you're going to get the air loss. So again, we go back to inverse square law, over distance, it's going to quarter in power uh, every doubling of distance which is a problem. So if we have an antenna that's already got a, say, a 6 dB boost passively on it, okay, we, 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 we re-boost our signal up again. Then I'm going to go for a crazy, stupid, long yeah. cable. All right, you know, I got a couple of choices here. Go for a really expensive cable, which is what we'd recommend to get the really expensive cable with ultra low loss on it. Or yeah, you make sure that you boost. But even boosting has a problem. When we come into our receiver system, these things are sensitive, very, very sensitive. We don't want to over boost a signal. And some people will do that as well. They will over, they'll put too many boosters, they'll be, well, put yeah. too much boost on the system. And you will over, you'll overload the reception path. So you'll actually overload the system when it comes in. And that in itself can create problems because now your ultra sensitive receiver system is being given way too much power to deal with. And you're boosting the noise along with that, right? Yeah. So like I said, the signal to noise ratio is what it is. Yeah. Um, if it's a bad signal. It's a bad signal. It's a bad signal. Yeah. And what you're saying is that more gain across the, the cable length is, is not better. Just like more gain in an audio system yeah. isn't better. You don't want to just turn your preamp all the way up into yeah. distortion. Um, however, there are some restrictions or, or there's some guidelines like yeah. minus 3 dB, 0 dB to minus 3 dB along the cable path is ideal mm -hmm. and it can be acceptable up to about 6 dB. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. and a little bit more, depending, okay. depending on, again, depending on the receiver system. Our main goal is that once we get from antenna, receiving antenna to receiver input, uh, we want to have 0 dB. As simple as that, as best we can. Yeah. Obviously, as you said, a little, little bit of loss is okay. But when it comes to people adding boosters, make sure you've understood how much that booster is going to do. So an active antenna or whatever, make sure you understand how much it's going to boost by so that when it gets, that signal gets to the receiver, you've also lost again to make that signal the nice level that the receiver expects to receive. Yeah. There are, I, th I can think of two main ways that that loss over the cable distance can happen, and that's the impedance of the cable, yep. which we're always trying to use 50 ohm cable. Yeah, yeah or more. Or more, okay, so at least 50 ohms. It's very dependent on the system you're using, and um, the cable lengths you're running. Yep. Um, so we have, we have, there are multiple different cable types out there that will do specific jobs for specific runs of cable length. So yeah, the standard cable, 50 ohms, is fine, but there are much other, there are other cables out there that will allow you to run over humongous distances. Yeah. Um, and yeah. honestly, if I were watching this before I knew what I'm about to tell you, I would be really overwhelmed. I'd say, oh my, I have to do all of these calculations to figure out how many dB is lost over this distance, but it's really much simpler than that. You guys and pretty much any manufacturer will have a calculator yep. that you can access yep. that you type in what receivers you're using, uh, how many there are. That'll yep. help you with antenna distribution and how far away those remote antennas will be if yep. you're using remote antennas. And it'll give you basically a, a bill of materials or a list of the products that you need, amplifiers, um, active antennas, yep. cables, 
that are needed to make sure that that loss over that entire circuit yeah. is acceptable. Yeah. And yeah. Wh where do we find that? I'll put a link in the description, yeah. Yeah. but that's online, that's right? Online. Yeah. yeah. So no matter where you are, if you're on the show site, probably a little too late to figure out what you're going to bring. But more importantly, for remote antennas, mm -hmm. if you're installing a system in your house of worship or into some sort of corporate environment, um, do these calculations first yeah. so that once you put it in, the antenna is where it needs to be. Uh, the receiver is where it has to be, yeah. and you know how you're going to get an acceptable signal level yeah. from that antenna to the receiver. And this is the good thing. I mean, obviously, with the, the world of digital, especially now that majority of products uh, are now moving towards Dante as an output source, uh, and, you know, Dante's become accepted and easy, we've now lost that problem of having antenna cables that go massively long. We can really get into the world of... You know what? Well, everything will run via Dante. I'll put everything here beside the stage. Off we go. But even beyond that, I mean, even even if you struggle to understand what's being spat out at you from a website tool, uh, one of the great things to do, and it's the most wonderful, it's the most wonderful thing about the audio community in general and the RF community. The number of Facebook pages out there for RF users is insane. And they are active, and they have people, you know, asking questions constantly. I'm facing this problem. I don't know what to do here. I've got this system. I've got that system. It's doing this. The answers that come in, and they flood in within minutes. So if you're ever facing problems, just literally go on Facebook, go onto a user forum of Facebook. You know, Sennheiser. We have a Sennheiser Wireless User Group on Facebook, which is independent from us. It's set up by Sennheiser Wireless users. I'm sure the competition have similar pages, and it is a community of people trying to help each other because. It can be daunting. It can be. It, it, it's it's not the simple world of XLR microphone mixer plug done. There's a lot more thought and planning that needs to go in there. There are a lot more things that can interfere. I mean, I'll give you a classic example. This is a camera receiver system. The number of times we get people going, oh, I've got I've got my uh, receiver plugged into my camera, and I'm getting noise. I can't figure it out. When I when I'm at home and I'm testing it, it's fine. I plug it into my I plug it onto my camera. Everything goes wrong. And it's a classic one. Yeah, how expensive is your HDMI cable that you're using? Because an HDMI cable, a cheap one, will broadcast RF. And they don't know this, but they've gone on the community. There are people who've experienced those problems. He will go, you tried this? Oh my God, it was the HDMI cable. Hey, move it to the other side of the camera. This thing's like this. Take the HDMI cable out. Go and buy a proper HDMI cable. Crazy little things like that. Um, while yes, there are tools available from all the manufacturers that will help you with this at the same time as well. Go and go and find the forums. Become a member of those forums so that you're talking to your peers, and eventually, maybe one day, you're a peer talking to someone who's getting into this for the first time. Because yeah. it can seem it can seem terrifyingly daunting the first few times you go out there and are trying to make a bit of money from your new system you bought yourself that you don't quite know how it does what it does. Yeah, and it, RF is a deep rabbit hole, and there are people who oh. specialize in it. But, uh, you know, I don't want to scare you. The reason that you're experiencing these dropouts during performances with your wireless system probably doesn't require all of the knowledge that exists. There are probably some simple solutions, and I think we've gone through that. Just as a recap before we go yeah. on with some other problems, it'd be just making sure that your antenna is relatively close to the transmitter making sure that you're using the correct equipment if you need to use a remote antenna. Well, I'm going to stop on the antenna thing just because it's a classic one we see. We do see, um, if you're doing like this, the camera portable systems, you, you sort of fly out of luck. But if you're doing a, if you're a musician, you have a band and you have say four or five channels of RF, classic one we, th we see is those four boxes put into a rack with the supplied stick antennas. And they're inside either a, Hopefully a plastic flight case, but a lot of times there could be an aluminium flight case. That aluminium flight case <laughs> sucks up the RF. But because there's eight antennas sticking out the back and they're probably all at a flat plane, that's a classic situation of where you really need to make a choice of, I'm going to spend a little bit of extra money, get the antenna system remote. So it's another box that you can put your, your, uh, your receivers into and then two antennas go to it. It's always something that you, you, we see quite a lot is people just don't understand that even the flight case you keep your system in can have a major effect. And if you're going beyond two channels, you really, really need to think about external antennas. It will really make a humongous difference to what's going on. Yes, it's more money, yeah. but 
it's well worth the investment because now you have one, only two antennas to worry about because everything's combining to that or splitting out from that. Um, and then you're good to go. Yeah. So if you have one channel, it's going to have probably two antennas. Yep. Fine. If you have two channels, uh, maybe each one of those will have two antennas. But ideally, they can all use the same two antennas. And those two antennas, the signals can be distributed. Yeah. Um, and like you said, that requires a different box, but it has benefits. Yeah. Explain to us why there are two antennas for a system. That is the diversity rule. So it goes back to that thing of we know that within a space we will get um, like room modes and audio, constructive interference to destructive interference. Unlike audio, we quite like constructive interference. It's good for RF because it means we're getting a boosted signal coming into the antenna. But destructive interference, just like an audio, we hate. Uh, and it's a simple case of depending on your antennas. If I have two widely spaced antennas, even better. Too close, it's not a huge problem. But this antenna is picking up the signal great. While this has a null point sitting on it, transmitter moves, the null point moves to here. This gets a bad reception, and this antenna can take over. And it just means we can switch between antennas backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards. And it's literally just a, an, an electronic switch inside. Switch, 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 switch. Yeah. As systems become more advanced, they become to the point where you get two complete separate re reception paths. So there's two different receiver modules inside a receiver. So they're independent of each other and they, again, assess which receiver pass is having the best reception. But that's just to do with price and it's a better system. So it's got a much stronger reception path with two dedicated receivers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And for anybody who doesn't understand what John is saying here with the null point, um, just like in acoustics, if you if you play a tone in your in your room, and especially if it's a rectangular room like most of our rooms are, you walk around and that tone may even completely disappear at some points, and it's really loud at other points. And that has to do a simple example of why that might happen is if I were talking to John, and let's say I was speaking at one frequency, like a tone, that frequency or that sound would go directly to John and it would also reflect off this wall and back to John. And if by the time those two copies of that signal mix at John's ear, uh, it may completely cancel. There may be a positive uh, period Boost, yeah. or a positive phase meeting a equally mm -hmm. negative phase, which pretty much equals zero. But having this little bit of spacing or even more spacing between these antennas can help to make sure that if the signal is being canceled at one of them, at the other one, hopefully it's not. <laughs> yeah. And like you said, there, there's, you know, simple diversity, true diversity, mm -hmm. intelligent switching diversity, diversity yeah. true bit diversity. Yeah. And each one of those has advantages that we don't necessarily need to get into here. Yeah. But just realize that having a wireless system that has diversity antennas and diversity receiver can benefit you. Yeah. The big one. And this has a lot to do with interference mm -hmm. of TV stations and uh, Wi-Fi systems and other people's wireless audio systems broadcasting on the same frequency range. And it also has to do with this idea of intermodulation. Yeah. Anytime you have two waves or two carrier frequencies that are within a close proximity to one another, they're going to cause intermodulation distortion that will result in other frequencies yeah. being created. Yeah. So that gives us the problem where, first of all, you need to make sure you're not broadcasting at the same frequency mm -hmm. that someone else is, or I guess better said, you will not have good luck if your transmitter is utilizing the same carrier frequency as a TV station. Yeah. Um, and then also if you have several channels of wireless, you need to make sure that they're set up in a way mm -hmm. that you can fit all the channels you need without experiencing um, dropouts due to using the same channel okay. or dropouts due to using a channel that is uh, one of those intermodulation frequencies, right? Um, a, an easy way to do that, like you mentioned, you have banks, yep. right? So if you don't want to get into this and you just have a few channels of wireless, just use one of those banks, yep. check out the... Um, every every yep. transmitter... Every transmitter and receiver tuned to the same bank, but a different channel in each bank, because yeah. those channels are already frequency coordinated for the customer's benefit. They just yeah. just trust it, it'll work. As long as the bank itself has X number of frequencies free. But most scans you will do with the system, depending on 
the system itself. A entry level systems might not show you how many channels are free, but you know our mid level systems will say, okay, on bank blah, there is twelve channels free. On bank two there are eighteen channels free, and on bank three there are thirty two channels free. I'm going bank three. Yep. Straight there. Just if you're just starting out with doing these scans, an important thing to note is that if your receiver does scanning, uh, make sure that your transmitters are off. Oh yeah. Right. Because what it's doing is it's scanning where there are transmitters and it's saying, well, you can't use that one. Yeah. So if you've got all your transmitters on yep. and you haven't selected the frequencies <laughs> yet, yeah. it's going to detect that and it's going to say we can't use that frequency. Well, it's also the classic one as well of uh, if you have your, your transmitters on and they're all sitting side by side on a table, um, that is maximum intermodulation frequency yep. generation point True. because all the transmitters are side by side. Yeah, when you, when you do a scan, everything off except for pretty much only one receiver. Just let that one receiver do everything. You can have the other receivers on, it's not a problem um, because they're just receiving. Mm -hmm. um, but have one receiver do the scan uh, and depending on, again, on the system, if they're networked, that one receiver can tell all the other receivers, okay, you're on that frequency, you're on that frequency, you're on that frequency, and you just press a button, it just goes, thunk it, sync. Yeah, that's one of the nice things, and there are different levels, but let's start at the most basic. Yep. Uh, if you've got one channel, do a scan with your transmitter off, it says you can use this this bank, and there are this many channels available, and then you assign the um, transmitter mm -hmm. to be on that channel, yep. and you're good. Yeah. Um, if you have another device or receiver that also does scanning but isn't somehow connected with that first one, you leave those transmitters on, a mm -hmm. little bit of distance mm -hmm. between them to avoid that intermodulation, yep. and then you do the same thing. You scan it, it won't pick the same frequencies yeah. because those transmitters are on, and then it'll tell you what the next transmitters can be, and, and you yep. go ahead and sync those. Yep. What's great about these networked options is that you can have one receiver that's connected via a network connection to all the other receivers in your system. And you can run one scan. It knows how many channels you've got. It tells you here are the frequencies you can use. And then you just go ahead and assign all the transmitters at once. Um, what else is there here? We've also got some advancements over the last, what, 10, 20 years. Oh, more than that. From analog to digital. Yeah. So help me understand what that has done for us. We're still using FM transmission. Yes. That's still basically the same principle. So the transmission is the transmission itself is still an analog transmission. We are still modulating a carrier frequency. We have to. But what we're doing is we have digitized the audio signal into that carrier frequency. Um, and it comes with a lot of benefits. Well, one, obviously, with a digital transmission, we are moving away from this wonderful thing that used to exist inside analog systems called a compander. And a compander was the only way we could transmit our audio because, as you said earlier, about the dynamic range we had available. So we'd have we'd have a certain dynamic range in the transmitter. We can't transmit that. We don't have enough uh, bandwidth to transmit that. So what we would have to do in the transmitter is compress the signal. We'd then transmit that, and then we could use an expander uh, in the receiver to expand that back out to the full dynamic range. Problem is, that creates audible artifacts that you can hear. You can hear that it's being companded. With a digital system, we don't need that. Compander gone. So, created audio imperfections disappear. What we can also do with a digital system is we can also make it a lot more spectrum efficient. You'd have to have, because of intermodulation with analog systems. You'd have to have a specific spacing that changed with the number of channels you came up with. With digital systems, not all of them, but quite a few of them, um, you can make them intermodulation free. Uh, so all of our digital systems that we have are intermodulation free, which literally means depending on the system, you can just go channel one, X number of kilohertz, channel two channel three, and just keep on going at the same spacing out. So we call that equidistant spacing. So it allows us to be a lot more spectrum efficient. The other thing we can do is analog systems also used to have, some of them used to have the ability to change the transmission power, 10 milliwatts, 50 milliwatts, 100 milliwatts, some even, you know, even a lot more, 250 milliwatts to really 
broadcast out. It's pretty low compared to radio stations. Radio stations are doing watts of power transmission. Even your mobile phone transmitter is doing watts of, uh, of power to you. But you know, 250 milliwatts is pretty powerful for a wireless microphone system. But that means you could potentially have X number of channels all transmitting at 250 milliwatts. That in itself is going to have a massive effect on the available spectrum space because your intermodulations are going to be that much more powerful. With digital systems, we can have a fixed transmission energy power, 10 milliwatts, 25 milliwatts, less even. We don't have to really go up to the 50 milliwatts or beyond anymore. Um, and that means, again, more energy efficient, longer battery life, not a bad thing for the world. Your batteries don't run out faster. But also because, we're, again, because we're transmitting at a certain amount of power, there's only yeah, there will be an increase. Every channel you add, you will increase on top of that energy in the space. But because of the digital thing, because we can do some, in this case, do some magic inside the transmitter, we can ignore those intermodulation frequencies. They are there. They're still created. Intermodulation will always be created, but we can ignore it with the digital systems. So it allows us to be more spectrally efficient, energy efficient. And to be perfectly honest, Audio-wise, not just because of the compander, because we got rid of the compander, but because of what we're doing and how we're sampling it, and I'm not going to go into how we do all this sampling. We can do quadratic amplitude modulation and all this weird uh, modulation to convert the analog to digital. But we can get to the point where a digital system can sound as good as a wired system. So if you had a wireless microphone with the same wireless capsule head on it as a wired capsule head, and you put them side by side, on some systems, they sound exactly the same. So you cannot tell. So it becomes a quality point here. All of a sudden, the performer, the person actually using the mic, so think of your Beyonce's, your Pink's, your Taylor Swift's, all that lot. They now have a much better sound coming from the system thanks to the fact that we're using a digital transmission system. Wow. So having this channel and spectrum efficiency means that we can put more channels into the same bandwidth. So if you're if you know that you're going to have 24 or more even channels of wireless audio, you may want to consider getting a system like you guys have yeah. developed um, that is going to allow you to do that more easily. Well, I'll give you a good example. This is this is our new Evolution Wireless Digital Portable System. Um, it's Basically, it's part of a family of digital evolution wireless families that we do. It's our generation five, basically, of our evolution wireless family. The previous version, the analog version of this, would be the evolution wireless 100 series. And you would get about 16 channels of these operating in one space, pretty happily. This, 90 channels in the same space because of the digital uh, equidistant grid spacing. So that's a humongous step up. You know, imagine, let's go again to that conference floor. You're at a trade show. You're interviewing someone. There's 50 other guys out there, influencers and so on, making videos. And they're all using an Evolution wireless analog system. If there's 50 of you, ooh, we're going to get tasty here. We're going to have a lot of problems to deal with, and we're going to have to potentially coordinate with each other or start hopping frequencies. With this one, if there's 90 of you in the same space, you're all on the same bank, but you've thankfully arrived one at a time and turned your system on the scene. Okay, that one's busy, that one's busy, that one's busy. You will have the space to, to operate and not have interference. Yeah, I just want to highlight how, how insane that is because even 50 is yeah. incredible for <laughs> compared to just a few decades ago. And now it's like, oh, 50, then we'll start having problems. Now we can do 90, yeah. and, and that's that's amazing. I saw you got you sent me a video of the one of the higher end wireless systems from Sennheiser, with like what was it like like 30 people on stage with a wireless mic yeah. doing backup vocals yeah. and the the uh, what do they call that dance the cho choreography? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the choreography that is available with that is just it, I mean it's groundbreaking. Yeah. It, it's something that could never have been done before because all of these performers are mobile and then go wherever they want. Yeah. That's especially true probably in like a theater setup as yeah. well. Yeah, right? um, I mean, a classic one, let's look at, you know, Hamilton, Cirque du Soleil, something like that, where there are 
a couple of hundred performers, not necessarily on a stage at the same time, but definitely backstage getting ready and they will need to be plugged in and ready to go. Yeah, beforehand you would have to coordinate very carefully. You could have that number of channels up in the air at once, but it would require massive coordination now. There's still some planning that needs to be done, obviously, um, but it's a lot simpler yeah. um, because you just, you, and you could leave all those channels on, just leave them transmitting, not worry about it. Yep. So it makes life so much easier. So, uh, you know, again, let's, let's make sure this is applicable to everybody watching. If you've just got one channel, it's really quite easy. Yep. Your receiver can do it. Yep. You, you sit, you, you put your transmitter to the, tr the frequency it told you to use and you're good. Yep. That can be done for up up to several channels oh, at yeah. this point. Yeah. If you're getting more into like a professional theater environment or a, a large festival where, or even a large convention where there's a lot of belt packs going around, there is this idea of frequency coordination. Mm -hmm. And there are even different levels of that. Um, you as the one audio engineer on site can use your wireless management system. Mm -hmm which is software you put onto your computer, you connect that computer then to the network, and then you can um, do a scan, which will scan, uh, if, this is especially important if you're like traveling as a tour, or you're doing a festival in a place that um, has its own unique mm -hmm. digital TV stations yeah. and has its own unique interference. You can run a scan with one of your receivers to see where anything is broadcasting. And then that software will actually say, okay, based on what's here, and based on how many of what type it knows everything about your show, um, this is the frequencies that it would recommend. And even better than that, if you're using Sennheiser stuff, you can say, okay, yeah, deploy that. Yeah, and it'll go ahead and right. assign everything yeah. for you. But that brings one thing we've not, which we've not mentioned. We, did, we kind of mentioned it when we were talking about um, the, the airspace is available to us, but there's something you need to be careful because you mentioned the idea of you're traveling with a show. That's the one thing you have to be really careful of. When you travel, when you go to a different country, your wireless system might be illegal in that country. Um, a lot of wireless systems require licenses to operate, um, which is why you have certain frequency systems like 2.4 gigahertz, which has its drawbacks, or you have 1.8 gigahertz, which is still in the UHF spectrum that we use that is license free. There are frequency bands that are free as well, but you've got to be careful traveling with your system. So if you are American based and you decide to come over for a trade show here in Germany, be very careful what system you bring because you could be breaking some laws. Not, not that you're going to go to jail or go to prison or anyone, but you're going to annoy people by having a system that cannot work or you're going to get annoyed yourself because your system just cannot work here. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's another thing that, especially when it comes to the big high end shows, they're very much aware of this. They'll work with rental companies in that location that will supply the wireless systems to them. Or they will have wireless systems that we call wideband systems. So they'll have a receiver that's a wideband receiver. It receives across the entire spectrum. And then they will have transmitters and transmitters only come in certain spectrum chunks. They'll have transmitters for America, transmitters for Europe, transmitters for Asia. And when they're doing a world tour, they'll just keep the ones they need. They don't need in boxes and take the ones out that they do need. Nice. Um, so yeah. And that's probably, you know, the highest level uh, when you're on a world tour yeah. or when you're going to a festival that has five stages or more. Um, at that level, there are whole teams of RF experts. Uh, a lot of these people are in those groups you mentioned before, but there's a whole world. I mean, if this stuff interests you, you may do some more research and there's, there's opportunity to oh, yeah. become valuable in the RF space. Yeah. Um, if you're going to a festival, for example, you are assigned, use these channels. Yeah. You don't just go to your stage and, and run it all the time, although that sometimes happens. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are whole teams that will ahead of time say, how many stages are there? How many channels of wireless does your band need? Yeah. Okay, we've done the numbers and we've we've run the calculations and here are the frequencies really that you're allowed to use yeah. to make sure that nobody steps on anybody else by yeah. just you know improvising through it. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we used to, uh, well, we do quite regularly, um, the Eurovision Song Contest. If you're not based in Europe, uh, I recommend looking at the Eurovision Song Contest online to understand what it is, and I apologize for having to watch it in the first place. As a, as a Brit, it's... Um, 
something we don't quite get. We never win it in Britain, oh, okay. so it's it's a it's a European thing. But it's a big international concert series. Yeah, the Germans are aware of it too. Yeah, and, and <laughs> I think the only awareness that I had of it, sadly, as an American, was the uh, the movie that was made yeah, that, after it. That was a good movie. <laughs> yeah. That was a good movie. But we have a we whenever whenever we've been the microphone system that's been supplied as the as the goat system to use, we'll have our uh, one of our technical application teams there uh, on site for six weeks. Um, and they'll have a constant scan going. So yes, the musicians are all, the different countries are assigned different frequency ranges for their microphones and it's theirs, it's blocked for them. We'll also have a, a, almost a police team of guys sitting there with the transmit with the receiver system scanning and they're looking for television crews coming in with these systems. And again, the television crews have to get permission to use that frequency and that frequency only. And you'll get random television crews rocking up to do interviews with no coordination. And they could jeopardize the whole show because they're on a frequency that's being used. So you'll, you'll get people walking around with mobile scanners, uh, mobile RF scanners, going up to people with the security and going, do you have permission? No, out. When it comes to that level, it becomes ultra serious. I mean, you're talking serious amounts of money here uh, to do a broadcast show like that. Uh, and then people take that very seriously. And that's where you know the RF coordinator or the RF engineers become vital to everything that's going on. So, you know, in an RF world, yeah, you'll have your your in-ear monitor mixer guy who's maybe using RF. You'll have your front of house guy who's maybe using RF, but they're all standard at a show depending if it's wired or wireless. But the real hero of the show is the RF coordinator. That's the poor uh, girl or boy who has to go out there and figure out what is free, why is it not free when it should be free, and who am I going to have to go out and find a big stick to beat them to turn off their wireless transmitter? Um, so it can be a really, really interesting career choice to go into that world. Um, as with a lot of things in audio, very demanding, but very satisfying at the same time, especially at the end of a show. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the moral of the story for somebody who maybe your band just has an IEM rig that you bring and you set it up. And it's not just your show that could be affected by just letting it rip and broadcasting at random frequencies. Yeah, it could ruin your audio, but it could also have implications for other people. So it's actually just, it's a really important and responsible thing to do to understand these basic principles yeah. and try to practice them yeah. as best as you can. So, hey, thanks for uh, explaining that stuff. Hopefully that helps you fix your audio problems uh, with your wireless system. In the next video, we're going to talk about how these things are being addressed with new technology. And it's some pretty exciting stuff. I mean, a lot of this is amazing technology compared to what it was just a few decades ago. But in a few years, we may be dealing with some really groundbreaking advances. Yeah. So make sure to watch the video that's on your screen now, and we'll see you over there.